you took your daughter to Tokyo when she was 11. Yeah. And it caught my ear because I took my daughter to Tokyo when she was 11. It's exact oh, wow. same thing. Yeah. And so tell me about what caused you to do that. To, I mean, to me, this is like how you train your kids to become good, curious, exploratory, courageous people is international travel. And also you get to discern which of your friends do you want to keep in the mix and which do you want to toss based on who's a good traveling companion for international travel. Oh, for sure. Um, so Japan, I mean, I was just, it's so exotic, strange, weird. I didn't know, like you probably didn't until you got there, that I figured that, okay, this, you will learn more in three years that in this one trip, it'll be worth three years of education. And I had two daughters. It's actually a more interesting story. I'll give the short version. My daughter, Chloe, her twin sister was supposed to go. It was her turn for a work trip with dad. Um, she got upset because, and she, re she regrets this now, is that that week that we were going to go to Japan, she was going to be told who her, I think like, fifth grade teacher was and everyone was going to find out and she's like i can't miss that for <laughs> oh no I'm like, it's a monumental life yeah moment. i can't go to japan i'm gonna find out who my yeah. teacher is next year i mean we we're, were, were flying first class everything was covered we had all these trips planned i'm like okay i have a feeling you're gonna regret this in 10 years but okay and then her twin sister raven is me in female form was like dad chloe's not going i'm going and i said here's the thing it's tomorrow so you have to be Chloe, and you're going to use Chloe's passport. I hope I don't get it. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> oh, that's good. And you have to, when you sign signatures, you are Chloe. And as soon as we landed after that you know, huge 11-hour flight, she starts writing an R. I'm like, hey, Chloe, I feel like you're disoriented. I'm looking at how bad your signature is. And she's like, Dad, what's wrong with my signature? I'm like, Chloe. I don't think <laughs> that you're in the right place right now. Do you want me to like show you where to write it on the form? And then she's like, oh. And so, you know, it was it was a great trip for dad-daughter bonding, but more importantly was it just taught her of, you know, you get this culture shock when you're in another country and how to deal with that as with an adult at the same time is suffering the same experience is the ultimate touchstone that we return back to all the time in terms of if it's uncertain and it's anxiety-provoking and it's difficult, Often, that is the most fun, pleasurable, best stories you'll have in your life. Oh, for, for sure. I mean, yeah, I think one of the things it teaches you, in, you know, in addition to, you know, sort of seeking curiosity and how to seek curiosity is, is adaptability. You know, when you travel internationally, uh, on that same trip, my daughter and I, we were in Tokyo. We had gone to Tibet before and we stayed in this, uh, this place uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And the place had no heating or air conditioning, uh, but they had about 30 blankets stacked on these pallets and you would sleep and you would get under the appropriate number of blankets based on how cold it was. That was how they regulated it. <laughs> there was a naked light bulb in the middle of the ceiling and there was a bucket in the corner. Uh, there was no bathroom. You had to go like outside down the sidewalk and through this, you know, to this outhouse basically for for the bathroom it was it was rugged but what it taught her was was sort of this new experience of well how do i do this how do i adapt and just this she has this innate curiosity but i but i was finding ways to cultivate it you'll try this new food hey let's go over here let's do this so it's just i think it's wonderful to do yeah i was going to ask you how your daughter did in terms of eating because a lot of times the menu has no English whatsoever and the waiters and waitresses can't speak English. Well, we had a role in our family, Todd, and uh, we had many roles. But when it came to food, we had a couple. And it, one was Smith's Try New Things. So if there was something on the menu that he noticed that we had never had, we had to order it. Um, and then the second was a hungry kid is, or a picky kid is a hungry kid. And so we do, we were basically not allowed to be picky. I love that. Yeah. It's so simple. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so we, when, we'd when order something me, unique and if you didn't want to eat it, that's okay. You don't have to eat it. You don't have to eat anything else. else. That's what the appetizer is. It's squid today. So yeah, yeah that's all you got. He took me to Peru. The same thing as you with your children is, you know, it was like a, 
every year one of us gets a one-on-one -on -one trip and the rules were we're going to go somewhere we've never been and do something we've never done so there were might maybe not the whole trip would be a thing that we've never done but there's going to be at least like a day or two of an activity at a minimum that is you've never done this before maybe it's scuba diving maybe it's paragliding maybe it's you know camping what river rafting whatever it is uh, and then the place of course was unique too so the weirdest thing i ever ate was guinea pig in peru and uh yeah i couldn't get out of it i knew i wasn't going to get out of it so i just tried it what's the condiment they give you with the guinea pig I don't nothing. Think nothing. Oh. <laughs> You're going raw on the it, guinea pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just do, like do you give me the guinea pig. You go medium rare. I have. I have they, no concept of what you do. With head that. and they all. They spit roast it whole body. So they present it to you. It's a full guinea pig, and you can see like the eyes and the teeth. Yeah, it's kind of. It's, it's kind of nasty. But it tasted pretty good. Is the is the guinea pig like the pigeon in the U.S. in terms of like the lowest rung just get out of our face? Is that why you would eat it? Uh, you mean like they give it to the American tourists to like insult them? <laughs> here's your here's your food, you slobs. Uh, no, I think it's actually kind of it's a it's a relatively common dish there. You know, it's not like you're like going to see fast food restaurants with yeah. guinea pig, but it it. it, it it was like most restaurants had it on the menu, unless they unless they were like a you know sushi restaurant or something. Yeah, I mean, one one of the fun parts of traveling to Asia is to figure out what's inside of a McDonald's because, you know, you, you know, you get salmon, you get sushi, you know, get shrimp tempura, and then you ask yourselves like, oh, oh, this would kill in the United States. Like, I don't understand why they McDonald's think McDonald's is amazing overseas. Yeah, yeah, McDonald's yeah. is incredible. Levin's incredible, right? Yeah. Exactly. Last year, I had like a 12-hour layover in Paris last summer, and it was just enough time for me to go to McDonald's, get a, like a large fry and an eclair, and then go to the uh, Eiffel Tower and take a picture with a mouthful of French fries, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but that was, you know, for my 12 hours in Paris, I enjoyed the McDonald's more than the Eiffel Tower. It was like, whoa, they, I ordered a Coca-Cola and they gave me a sou a full like glass souvenir cup inside the bag that I still have. And it was like the burger was, it resembled the picture. It wasn't smashed uh, into a little paper wad. Like they really give it their all over there. This is the beauty of taking children traveling is they appreciate the small things. Wait, so what, what was your adventure in Peru and what was your novel adventure in France. Um so we did we did two things in Peru that I had never done but well we did a few but the highlights were paragliding which Sean did uh powered paragliding just paragliding with a propeller on your back uh because we don't have cliffs and mountains in Texas. Uh so he he had I had done it. He had yeah. done paragliding. I had not. So this is like the second day in Peru. We drive out to this mountain in the middle of nowhere which probably was a hill but to me was a mountain at the time uh and we will hike up to the top and this guy eduardo's like all right you're going to uh you're going to fly today and i was like oh my gosh what by myself <laughs> it was like yeah man so he kind of like gave me basic instructions he's like all right so uh you want to go right you pull right you want to go left you pull left uh you want to you want to put the brakes you just pull both okay uh, I think you're good to go. And I was like, no way, man. They, 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 they left so me. limited instruction. We didn't practice. We didn't watch videos. I'm not sure there was a waiver involved. It was the basics. And then, like, I'm all strapped up. I'm ready to go. And, you know, you run and jump off the, the mountain, right? Like, it, the wind picks your glider up and just pulls your feet up off the ground. And then, ideally, you don't touch the ground again until you're it's all over it on purpose and he goes oh yeah by the way when you're ready to 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 break don't pull them too hard all right buddy and i was like what does that mean what do you mean don't pull them too hard like he goes if you if you pull them too hard you're gonna have a bad time and i was like i'm not liking this so i run off and like in, you know, five seconds later, I'm flying by myself and I'm like, oh, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap, holy crap. 
And I can see the little car that we drove up in. It looks like a little Hot Wheels car. It's tiny way down there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am doing this by myself. And I get to the end and I'm like, okay, I remember what I wanted to say. Like, don't just yank the brake. Yeah, because if you, you don't want to stop 12 feet in the air. Because that's just what drop. you want to do, by the way. You want to, you're like, oh, here comes the ground, here comes the ground, here comes the ground. You want to just go, ah, like you would if you like ran up on a red light, you know, a little bit later. Yeah. It, and that's not good because you'll just fall. So I'm like, I'm going to kind of like lightly squeeze. And somehow I stuck the landing, both feet did not fall over. And he just, it was funny, you know, like time hop app where it sends you like memories. Anyway, they'll send you memories of like phone pictures and videos you took. Uh, Sean sent me that video like a week ago. Yeah. yeah. It was like on this day, 12 years ago or something like that. Yeah. Do those experiences in your younger life, whether they're cultivated by your parents or they just come up, you know, come upon you, do those carry forward and create or stifle curiosity later on? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in some ways, you have this critical developmental window. Let's say it's between, it's sort of like when you develop self-consciousness. So kind of between 10 and 15. It's one of the reasons why you've got this research showing that your favorite music during your lifetime sort of freezes around 18 to 21. It's like whatever you like then. And, and whatever athletic team you liked when you were around the age of 11 or 12, it's pretty much your favorite team for the rest of your lifetime, particularly... When you focus on why players, you, why do you think that happens? Like my my mother in law, she I mean she loves Elvis. Like you know she's eighty, um, but a lot of people do. But but it's it is it that formation of what you liked in your formative years just locks in. Why does that happen? It's like it's like you're you're defining the sense of self. And so I mean anyone that's listening, if you think about it, if you have kids, you think really carefully. So don't stress about it, but think about. This is a window where I can get my child to identify as being adventurous, risk-taking, brave, leadership, independent. Like that trip in Hong Kong and in Japan that I took with Raven, she still talks about to this day. And she will describe herself at age 17 as an international traveler, despite the fact I'm not sure we traveled to any country since <laughs> over the past six years. It was like a window where... She would tell her friends, she dis she had this distinctiveness from her friends of the only one that's been to Japan, the only one that's climbed Mount Fuji and spent overnight on the side of the mountain, um, and then actually seen the sun rise and where it's like, like negative five degrees on the top of Mount Fuji. She defined herself as a mountaineer, as an international traveler, as someone that likes adventure, and here she is, a middle-class white girl living in the suburbs outside of DC. And I think this is why if you have the opportunity to do these things is because I want to write, if she identifies with these qualities as part of her sense of self, when she's given the opportunity, she's more likely to do thumbs up versus thumbs down. And that's why I want all my kids to live.